Again, this is Dennis Watts with Local Government Risk Management Services. I want to welcome all of you to our uh, Safety Coordinator Fundamental Session 2, which is going to focus primarily on accident and incident investigations and job hazard analysis. We appreciate you taking time to uh, do these webinars with us. We've designed them to be very short and to the point. Uh, they'll be done within the hour. Um, and again, we thank you for, for being here. Here's what we want to accomplish um, through these three sessions that we've we've had starting last week and going through this week and continuing on through next week. Our goal is at the end of the three sessions, you're going to have a greater awareness of the duties and responsibilities of the local government safety coordinator. From our perspective, the safety coordinator at the local level is really key. It's the conduit for for our staff at LGRMS to help you with your safety and uh, and loss control programs. So it's really a, a key player and the person on the ground who's going to make sure that your employees stay safe and protect your local government's assets as we go forward. We also want you to have a basic foundation for workplace safety. And, and in doing that, we're going to give you an overview of key safety functions and concepts such as the topic today, which is accident and incident investigations. We're also going to give you a template for a basic safety program that will be using the requirements to qualify you for either the GMA safety grant or the ACCG incentive program. If you meet the requirements of both of those programs, not only do you get a financial reward, but you also have done the things required for a good basic safety program. So what we require for these three sessions is number one, you've got to attend all three sessions to, rece to receive credit for safety coordinator attendance. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, this is our way of virtually helping you meet requirements that GMA and ACCG require for safety coordinator training. We've offered each of the sessions twice, once in the morning and once in the afternoon on different days each week. And again, uh, we did session two earlier this week on Tuesday, and we're redoing again today. Next week, we'll offer session three, which is on local uh, government vehicle operations, again on Tuesday at 10, and then uh, on September 10th at 1 p.m. We're also going to schedule a makeup session where we'll offer all three sessions once again, but all in the same day, and that will be on September 29th. So if you need that, uh, be on the lookout for that announcement, or you can email uh, me directly um, with, with that with request for that link. As we go through this presentation, I want you to think in terms of workplace safety. As we as our primary presenter, which is going to be Vincent Scott, talks about this, I want to point out the control panel on the GoToWebinar screen. There's a box that says questions. All you need to do if you have a question, it can be either on a topic that's being covered or an admin question, go ahead and uh, open that box, press a little arrow, write your question in there, and then we'll look at that and either respond where everybody sees the question and gets the answer, or if it's more pertinent to you individually, then we'll just respond directly back to you. Or you can just email me uh, at dwatts at lgrms.com. That is d-w-a-t-t-s at lgrms.com with your question if you'd rather have it answered through email. So what have we covered so far? Uh, our first session covered introduction to the fundamentals of being a safety quarter, and we talked about audits and self-inspections. All these topics are interrelate, interrelated with each other. Session two, which is today, we're gonna to talk a good bit about accident and incident investigations, why we need them, and also job hazard analysis, how we actually do a job. And then next week, we'll do session three, which is gonna be local government motor vehicle considerations, and we'll discuss how the ACCG incentive and GMA safety grant requirements work. So our primary presenter today will be Vincent Scott, and I'm gonna have Vincent introduce himself to you in just a moment. But before we get started, I have already have two questions I wanna ask Vincent. Uh, before you join us, Vincent, you are the risk manager at Henry County. Um, in your mind, why is it important to conduct incident or accident investigations? What's the importance of doing this? Good afternoon. It's important to conduct accident and incident investigations because it lets the organization know where your safety problems may lie or what safety problems you may have. Those accident and incident investigations are some tail signs, and we'll talk about 
what those signs are or, or possibly poor work practices that may that may be there involved in your area or in your working group. Very good. Uh, another question for you. Uh, do you have an interesting or odd investigation you were part of in your time uh, uh, in Henry County? Yes. Um, and this one actually ties in a little bit to what you guys have learned in the previous session, in session number one. There was an, ac there was an accident that occurred in which an employee driving a dump truck hit a struck a vehicle struck another vehicle in the rear. Well, we found through the accident investigation that the employee had that the employee had been doing his he has been doing his vehicle inspections, and we saw that the cover over the brake pad of the dump truck had been missing. We saw it marked on the on the on the um on the vehicle inspection, and with that. And with that piece missing, we knew that, hey, you know, that easily caused that accident because his foot actually slipped off the pedal. So we found that there were some issues there, you know, with the inspection process and the follow up of the inspection process. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, I can see a clear tie in through invent, uh, uh, through uh, preventive maintenance and, and these incident investigations. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. So talk about yourself and then tell us about accident investigations. Uh, thank you. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vincent Scott. I joined local government risk management in April of 2018. I've been here now, going on about two and a half years. I have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and a Master of Science in Occupational Safety and Health. I've worked with local government, local and state governments for about 15 years. And as you can see, I really enjoy working with local governments. And that's why I felt that I was a perfect fit when with, L, with LGRMS. Um, my contact information is also listed there at the bottom of the screen here. So if you need anything, please feel free, you know, to send me an email or to call our number directly. So we're going to get started with today's presentation and we're going to start in the first section, which involves accident and incident investigations. As you may know, the goals for this section is to provide you with some working knowledge to perform an accident and incident investigation. And we'll also be able to see how that accident or incident investigation is so important to your organization. When, employee, when an employee is involved in an accident or an incident, it's imperative to take the time to perform an accident or an incident investigation. These investigations are going to provide an opportunity to uncover some safety problems or correct some issues before they reoccur. So with our objectives, we're going to go through a few things in which you're going to be able to see how these things unfold out. You will understand that need for investigation. We'll determine some causes of the accidents. We'll even discuss some different ways to investigate, and then we'll identify what prevention methods may be out there. With an accident, the definition is any undesired or unplanned event arising out of employment, which results in a physical injury to the employee or damage to the property, whether it belongs to the employer or to an outside party. An incident is an event which does not result in an injury or damage, but it has the potential to do so. Now, Remember that with any incident or near miss situation, it may not result in that injury or damage, but it does disrupt the flow of the operation, meaning that someone has to perform an investigation. So therefore, in those situations, they must also be investigated and addressed as well. And with our accidents, we know that the potentials are employees being injured, or even that property damage once again, and those things can come in different categories, whether it's a minor injury or major, or even death or catastrophic. So it's important that we recognize that accidents and incidents just don't happen. Now, with our pyramid, it tells us that as we see these accidents and incidents kind of play out, we can kind of group these things to show that accidents and incidents just don't happen. 
we know that taking that looking over a period of time, we see that we've had a possibly about 600 near misses or incidents that have occurred. We know that 30 of those turned out to be actual accidents. And that and those actual accidents included someone being injured or some type of property damage. We know that 10 of those were disabling. And by disabling, we mean it was probably either the loss of that piece of equipment or that employee losing time from work. And then we've seen that there's always that one. And that one is the one that we remember. That one is also that one that kind of ends up on the news, whether it's a catastrophic incident or a death. So it basically lets us know that accidents and incidents don't have to happen. Our pyramid shows us that these things are predictable and even preventable. So we're going to look at what are the ways in which we can prevent these accidents by being able to predict them through our accident investigation process. In our accident investigation process, you're gonna see that the investigation is a systematic approach to examining an accident or incident to identify certain conditions, behaviors, hazards, and then ultimately finding the root cause of that accident or incident to be able to identify it as well as implement any corrective actions necessary to prevent similar occurrences. These investigations focus on identifying and correcting those root causes, but it's important that we understand that they do not establish fault, as these investigations are essential to any good safety program because they're going to help build that morale. And we'll talk about building morale and, and how, that, how that can affect an employee if you establish fault. So in our first step, we want to ensure that we document. And by documenting, we want to get a brief overview of the situation from the employee, witnesses, or anyone else who was directly involved with the incident. Our goal in this portion is to collect enough information to understand the basics of what happened. Okay. Next, we want to examine the accident scene or the incident scene. We want to look for things that will help us understand or determine or determine what happened. This can include looking at looking at dents, looking at cracks, looking at scrapes, or even splits in the equipment, tire tracks. And we know in many investigations as it relates to vehicles, tire tracks are very important because we can follow those tire tracks or those tire marks because those things show us that as a vehicle speed increases, its stopping distance is also going to increase. Therefore, you may see so, uh, some skid marks, and those skid marks can tell you how fast the vehicle was traveling because the length of the skid marks will show you that. Right? Footprints are also, a good, are also something that we may want to look at as it relates to looking for spills or leaks, maybe even scattered or broken parts. But we want to be sure that we also take photographs as photographs can kind of clear our minds as we go back to write this information down. It can kind of bring it back. It can kind of bring it back to us. Next, we want to identify any contributing factors. And these contributing factors can include environmental factors, design factors of the equipment or the tools someone may be using, the procedures and looking at those procedures. And then finally, human behavior. With the design factor, it includes the workplace layout, the design of the tools and equipment, and even looking at those maintenance records. Procedure factors can include the lack of procedures, inappropriate procedures, or even inadequate training procedures in housekeeping. And then finally, human behavior. We know that human behavior is very common in accidents and incidents. And that's because human behavior can include things such as carelessness, rushing, as well as fatigue. And we know that those can be some of the most attributed factors. So as we find these things out, 
they ultimately help us find the root cause of the accident. So as you can see, we've talked about documenting, collecting our information, and finding the root cause of the accident. So when talking about those root causes, what basically makes up the root causes? Well, we find our root causes in either two categories. Those categories can be an unsafe act or an unsafe condition. And let's look at our two pictures here. In the top picture, what do we see? We basically see a group of employees working and it looks like an employee working with some trustees and i know working with local governments some of you all do work with trustees from time to time well what are they doing we see that they're putting up the holiday decorations and we all know that when holiday when the holiday time comes especially for my city members we have to have that rush and getting out and putting those holiday decorations up right and then putting those holiday decorations up, we've come up with some different ways over the years or throughout the years in getting out there, getting those decorations up in a timely manner, as well as getting those decorations down. So in our picture, we see an actual unsafe act actually occurring. They, we have an employee that is loaded, the trustees in the bucket of the front end loader as they are putting up the holiday decorations. We know that that is a definite no-no because that front end loader basically tells us that what? No one is to ride in the bucket. You're only supposed to ride where? In the seat, and that's the operator. So yes, it's probably the quickest way that they can do it, but it's not the safest way. Therefore, we have an unsafe act that we're looking at. And we find that those unsafe acts is an act that's caused by the injured person or another person which can cause an accident or an incident. Well, our other accident cause or root cause that we may have is an unsafe condition. With an unsafe condition, let's look at our picture on the bottom. We see a heavy traffic or some rush hour traffic. So with rush hour traffic, what are some things that we can ask ourselves? What's the weather like? What time of day is it? What about the other vehicles? Because we can't actually control those other vehicles. We know that with those other vehicles, we could have aggressive driving, either even in ourselves, right? Distracted driving, possibly even impaired driving or fatigued driving. So we know that it is important that we also recognize those unsafe conditions as they are conditions which cause the accident or incident basically independent of the employees. So in our accident, we have the accident weed. And it cannot be stressed enough that a successful incident or accident investigation must once again focus on discovering the root cause. These investigations are not effective if they are focused on finding fault or blame, as I stated earlier. If an investigation is focused on finding fault, it's always going to stop short of the root cause, basically because we haven't found out what actually caused the accident. Now, if we think back to our pictures as we were talking about those hazardous practices or those hazardous acts, what were those employees that were in the guard looking at? Possibly when they were in that beat, when they were in that front end loader, we see that that front end loader, that was the hazardous act. Were those employees properly trained? You know, with, and it's important to remember that with trustees, we also have to train the trustees on the, on the jobs in which they will be doing, right? What about other hazardous conditions? Poor housekeeping. Poor housekeeping is a big one. As you learn within your facility inspections that with housekeeping, housekeeping can be one of the major causes of accidents, whether it's cords laying across the floor, whether it's a messy storage area, right? And then we have equipment failure. So those employees that were standing in that bucket 
what if the equipment had failed? All right? The equipment failure would be one of the hazardous, that would be a possibility of the hazardous condition, but not the root cause because it would ultimately go back to that lack of training. So as we look at our accident, we look at some of our root causes. We find poor work procedures, lack of training, not following up or giving employees feedback, or big one, not enforcing the rules. And it's very important with any type of safety that we enforce our safety rules. Remembering that the main goal must always be to understand how and why these existing barriers against hazards are what we're actually looking for so that those, so that those hazards don't injure or damage our property. Next, we have our corrective action. And in planning the corrective action, it is best to know how we're going to implement those corrective actions. So it tells us that with implementing corrective actions, management must be involved. It is important that management is involved in implementing your corrective actions. Why should management be involved? Because in any type of corrective action, it's going to take some time to get those things resolved. As you can see, it may be implementing a new process. It may be implementing a new policy. So you want to ensure that you continue to implement practical corrective actions. Not only will they reduce the risk of future incidents, but they will also be able to improve the organization's morale as well as safety. Now, it is the responsibility of the investigator to follow up on all corrective action implementation. That investigator may look to set target completion dates. That investigator may also look to update the investigation as they may find out other information or other supporting details. But that's why we said it was so important that you, tie, that you have that management support because that partnership with those supervisors and managers in developing and implementing those corrective actions will ensure the feasibility to help us establish good timelines and good target completion dates. Because I know like many of you all, we have projects that we've probably been working on for a very long time, especially since the, the pandemic has started. And it's important that we set time, that we set a good target completion date to finishing those things up. So that's that good follow-up. Also, and you're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth in, your, in, in session number three, but safety action planning with your accident investigations. You'll be able to use those for your safety action plan because they may let you know that, hey, we actually have a problem going on in, in such and such department. Or we may have an issue working with certain tools. One of the things that we found during my time as a risk manager at Henry County, for those of you who work with the public safety folks, we see that in the new, that in the new Ford, those new Ford Taurus police interceptors, you find that the backs of them or that rear view, or that rear view camera does not allow the deputies to see when backing. So one of the things that we had to, that we had to improve was those employees, those deputies being able to see while backing. So we had to add an aftermarket backup camera on those, but we found that through our safety action plans because our trends showed us that in the sheriff's department, we had a lot of backing accidents. So with your safety action plan, you're gonna see how you're gonna look to find those trends and see what those trends are telling you. At this time, are there any questions? All right, so we're going to move along to the next se section in our presentation today, which is the job hazard analysis. Now, the job hazard analysis you'll find is kind of going to go hand in hand with some of your accident and incident investigations. 
because the goals for the job hazard analysis is to provide some basic risk management skills in using the job hazard analysis to identify and reduce the risks of any job or task. So with those accident investigations and that, and that safety action planning, and once you've identified those trends, now you're going to find out what those hazards and those risks are through your job hazard analysis. We know that with it, there are many different ways or many different hazards associated with many jobs. Each job could have its own frequency or severity level of those hazards. Once the hazards are identified, a key component is to identify the risks involved with each of those hazards and the likelihood of its occurrence. This will help you prioritize which hazards can be eliminated as well as assisting in reducing the likelihood of an injury or damage claim. So this tells us that any effective safety program will use the job hazard analysis to identify those hazards before they happen. So let's take a look at some workplace hazards. What are hazards? We find that hazards on inherent biological, chemical, or physical characteristics of a material system or process that has the potential for causing harm. When evaluating hazards within your organization, there are some things that you should consider. As you can see in our cartoon strip here, hazards in the workplace can come just about from anywhere, whether it's the human interface, the environment, materials we use, tools, the layout of a workstation, or even our equipment and machinery. The focus of any hazard identification should be on these four items the level of exposure, the duration of the exposure, the potential for or the effects of a simultaneous exposure, and then finally, what are your current controls in place? So as we look at some of those hazards and we've seen them, you know, we kind of say, hey, we can recognize some of those, right? The physical hazard, maybe there's a, maybe there's a spill on the floor or maybe a piece of broken carpet, right? We can recognize some of those things. Our ergonomic hazards, now in which when we're working at home or we're working in alternate workstations, you know, to, com to, com be to comply with the social distancing, they may not be set up like our normal workstations. So it's important that we recognize those hazards or those hazards before they can occur. So let's look, so let's kind of walk through a job hazard analysis. As we see here on our picture, and this picture should be familiar to you because this was a picture in which you saw in your facility inspection, right? Walking through. What is the employee doing? What type of equipment is the employee using? What can happen? All right? So with any job hazard analysis, it's important that we use it because it helps us spot those overlooked hazards. It also reveals to us what hazards may have surfaced after the task was instituted. It can also reveal hazards that may surface even if the job was modified. So the first thing we want to do, we want to select the job or task or piece of equipment. Now jobs should not be selected at random. As we stated, coming out of our accident and incident investigation with those with using that safety action plan or reviewing those accidents and incidents. Maybe we see a department where they've been having some incidents going on. So we know that, hey, we probably need to take a deeper look. So our job hazard analysis is now coming into play. You want to go over your written records of accidents. You want to look at certain things such as accidents that have required lost time property damage, equipment replacement, or even the repair of certain pieces of equipment. Now new or modified jobs are also great job, a great, a great job hazard analysis to conduct. But those high frequency accidents and those and those jobs that have severe potential for employees to be injured or property to be damaged, those should raise your major calls for concern. 
Next, we want to select an employee to observe and tell them the purpose. So who do you select? Well, it's important to remember that it's the employee's job and they probably know it better than we do. This will also help get their buy-in for this purpose. As anytime working with safety, you want to get those other employees to buy in on it. And also remember that two sets of eyes are always better than one. So the hazards that you may see, they may not see them. And that could go likewise. You may not see the hazards that they see. So next, we want to observe the task being performed. Ask the employee, what are the various steps that they take? The employee is going to have some good insight in this portion, but we also need to remember that the employee may leave out some steps because these things are automatic to them because they do the job so frequently, right? So we want to ensure that we ensure that they go over each step. And as they go over each step, we record the steps. We review the steps for accuracy. And then we may even have other employees that work within that department or do that same task, get their input on it, just to ensure that we have all of the information as it relates to those steps. Now, in a job hazard analysis, it's common that we represent each task of the given job. And you'll see that in the end on how we go through each task when we're talking about using a ladder. It is also good that we give a description of the task because that description that we give, we know that in some cases, we can sometimes write out some things that we can better understand, you know, by taking some short notes or things of that nature. In our next step, we want to engage the employee in discussion. We want to work with that employee for recommendations. We want to give them structured questions like what if or why? Asking questions, what could go wrong? What could cause the things or those things to go wrong? What are other factors that can contribute to those things going wrong? What would happen if these things went wrong? And then finally, how likely is it that the things went wrong or will go wrong? After speaking with that employee, now it's time for us to start identifying those existing and potential hazards. And a good hazard description should always include the following items. The environment, where does this hazard exist? The exposure, who might be injured or made ill or what type of property damage could be caused by this hazard? Some other triggers. What event or events might cause a hazard to lead to an accident or an injury? There may be some contributing factors. Are there other factors there that can contribute to that hazard? And it's important that we understand the outcome or the consequences of those hazards. What would be the result if that hazard were to occur? And that employee is going to give us that insight. That employee is going to let us know. You know, what could, what's the worst that could happen? So as we've <clears throat> completed or we get, we've, we've written our hazard descriptions, now it's time for us to look at some controls. And when you look at controls, the hazard never really does lead to the accident or injury. You know, if you've identified a severe hazard or one with a great chance of causing an accident or injury, you want to ensure that you address that one immediately. Now, when looking at your when looking at your list of when looking at the list of controls that we have here, let's let's kind of go through them. We see that the best control or the most effective control we have is elimination and substitution, because those basically remove the hazard. But in many cases, we are not able to remove the hazard. So what should we have to do? Well, let's look, oh, sorry. So what should we do? Engineering controls eliminate or reduce the exposure to that hazard. So basically that engineering control 
isolates people isolates the people from the hazard. When we talk about an example of an engineering control, it would be one such as enclose, enclosing a noisy motor in a soundproof box. As we've seen from some of our recent safety themes, hearing, hearing safety is very important, whether you work inside of an office or in the outside. Hearing safety is very important. Another control that's also very effective are administrative controls. Administrative controls involve modifying the way people work around the hazards to reduce those risks. So some of your modifications could be written to be written programs, things such as your work rules or procedures. For my public safety folks, that could be your SOGs or your SOPs. And then we have training. But more likely what we see are job rotations that help us minimize these exposures. And many times we find that limiting the number of hours someone works in adverse weather conditions is a great example of administrative controls, right? You know, if it's hot outside, maybe we want to have them come to work earlier in the morning. And then finally, we have personal protective equipment. We know that Personal protective equipment or PPE basically provides a physical barrier between the hazard and the employee. Things such as eye, ear, face, hearing protection, as well as head or respiratory protection are all examples of personal protective equipment. Now, it is important to remember that PPE should only be used as a last resort or once the other forms of controls have been all have, have all been tried. PPE may be used in a combination with some of those other controls as well. So as we talk about using PPE as a combination, look at some of your current CDC guidelines as it talks about social distancing. Yes, they recommend the social distancing, and we can look at that as an administrative control, but then they also recommend what? The face covering. And that's your PPE. So that's an example of using controls, some of your controls together. So let's put our job hazard analysis all together. What does it look like on paper? Well, on paper, you'll basically see the job steps. And as we looked at using the ladder, what are some of your job steps? We find that our job steps are setting up the ladder, ascending and descending the ladder, meaning going up and down. And then the work that's performed on the ladder. Those are the steps that we're going to use. So maintaining a good job as an analysis program, we must remember, is going to be an evolving and an ongoing process. Well, you say an ongoing process because of what? Those potential hazards that take us into the next portion. What are those potential hazards? That ladder falling over or the ladder being unstable? Possibly the employee reaching out too far to perform the work that's on the ladder. Or maybe we'd have the wrong ladder for the job. So with your job hazard analysis, it's important that we remember that we review those, that we review them, or we look at them on a periodic, on a periodic basis. Because we want to ensure that the controls we have in place help us reduce the hazards. So where are our controls? Setting the ladder, setting the ladder feet on a solid level. When reaching out, ensuring that we keep our center of gravity. That way we don't go over the rails on either side of the ladder. And it's always important to remember, as we saw in our picture there, never stand on the top of the ladder. Never stand on that top rung of the ladder or that step or that step on the ladder that tells you don't stand above this step. Those things are very important. So after you've looked at your controls, we ask ourselves, okay, what should we do next? Well, we want to, we want to ensure that we investigate all incidents and accidents. We review our job hazard analysis, and we review those when there's a close call or a near miss, when an accident or an injury occurs, when the job changes, or possibly even when an employee suggests considering some changes. Once again, we always want to ensure that we engage the employees in the job hazard analysis. Now, 
Many organizations fail to use job hazard analysis because it takes time and effort, right? We have to analyze each job, look at specific tasks, you know, find equipment, you know, talk about that equipment. So it takes a lot of time. So it's important that we remember that it's more cost effective to perform a job hazard analysis because it's going to save us time, it's going to save us money, and certainly reduce accidents and injuries. So with our job hazard analysis, we may possibly have new policies or procedures. And all corrective procedures and processes must be communicated to all employees, not just those who are directly affected by it, right? Any changes must be fully explained. We know that some changes, employees need to understand why the changes are being implemented and how those changes will be implemented. And we know that all employees who do the job must undergo training on those changes or those new job procedures. So we have here a new procedure on ladder safety, telling us our do's and our don'ts, right? And you say one of the biggest things that we see with ladder safety is maintaining those three points of contact. Now we see on the don'ts, it looks like he has three points of contact with that right leg kind of wrapped around that outside rung, but he's actually reaching over. So in, 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 in trying to maintain one, he breaks another that we found that were one of our controls in which we must process. Now, I hope that you all gazed a lot from our accident investigations as well as our job hazard analysis training today. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Dennis. Thank you, Vincent, appreciate it. Uh, I've got a couple of closing remarks, but I did have another question for you, and this is in reference to accident investigations in, in a local government. Who should be the person or who should actually do the uh, incident or accident investigations? The first person, the first employee that we recommend to perform the accident investigation or is the supervisor of that employee. And it's important that the supervisor performed that accident investigation because that supervisor is aware of the task that that employee is doing as well as how to perform that task. So that supervisor knows those steps, that supervisor understands those controls, and that supervisor understands what could possibly happen while performing those job duties or that job task. So we want to look at the supervisor first. Next, they may call on one of you all as safety coordinators to perform an accident investigation. And that's also a good resource because you come in looking at it, in some instances, from a department looking, on the out, looking from the outside in. And that gives it another set of eyes. As we stated earlier, two sets of eyes are always better than one. Very good, appreciate that. Um, just a comment on uh, job hazard analysis for every, everybody. Uh, that process comes from industry, from manufacturing primarily. And one of the things we want you to know is you don't necessarily need to do a job hazard analysis on all of the different jobs that your employees do. That would be probably hundreds of, of different tasks. But you do want to look at potentially doing those where there has been an incident or an accident or where maybe you've got another new piece of equipment that you're bringing into uh, your local government. All those things would be a great way uh, to use that job hazard analysis process. And it's very easy to take that job hazard analysis and turn it into uh, a small training event as well. So again, uh, thank you, Vincent, for, for your uh, sharing with us your knowledge on accident incident investigations and job hazard analysis. Um, just a couple of admin things. Again, I want to remind everybody that if for some reason you missed one of the earlier presentations uh, or maybe you've got another employee that you want to participate, we'll be doing a makeup session for all three sessions on 29 September. Session one will be at 9.30 to 10.30 approximately. Session two from uh, 11 to 12, and then session three from 1 to 2 p.m. on September 29th. So just another opportunity either to make up one you missed or maybe uh, send another employee to take this training. We don't care how many people take it. We're just trying to provide you the benefit of, uh, of 
meeting the requirements um, for training this year. You'll also be given a copy of the webinar by recording and a few handouts. You're probably receiving those in the next few days. Most of you who were on the first session should have already gotten a link to the uh, recording for the first session, some handouts. If you didn't, again, shoot me or Vincent or any of us an email. Again, we appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate what you do. And uh, if there's anything we can do for us, please uh, contact us at uh, Local Government Risk Management Services. Hope all of you have a safe week, a good Labor Day weekend coming up. Uh, don't, uh, don't party too hard. Take care. Have a great day.